Well, thank you for inviting me to the webinar to tell you a little bit about Good Grief Guides, Lee. And it's the first one of these I've done, so just bear with me. I'll be putting up some photos as I'm speaking a little bit later on. Um, as a photo often shows you what we've been doing without the need for words. Um, and it just gives a snapshot of what we've been doing in our community. And also an indication of where we can actually progress and how we can continue with it. As Sarah says, please ask questions. Uh, I'll answer them if I'm able, and I'll be asking Sarah to help me if I can't. Um, the first meeting of Good Greek Geisley was in November 2019. Uh, it's a community initiative. It's led by local residents and organisations experienced in bereavement and community development, and it's supported by the Leeds Bereavement uh, Forum. We hope to open up conversations around grief and loss to provide or enable community spaces for all ages to feel that they, we, feel supported in grief and loss and building upon the care and compassion, which is really just so evident in our community. When thinking about the working name of the group, we wanted it to reflect the area. It, was, it had to be small enough for people to identify with yet be as inclusive as possible. But we also recognise that the moment you actually put a name on something, you put boundaries on it. And uh, we didn't particularly want it to be boundaries. We knew we were part of a bigger conversation, both nationally, internationally, around death, dying and grief, um, both within the services and also within the community. So we're just part of that bigger conversation. So really, we should be good grief guysly and beyond a bit like Buzz Lightyear. We're working from a defined area, but not with a defined area. There's so many types of communities, these sports groups, book clubs, arts, theatre, walking groups, brownie scouts, church groups, friends of parks and cemetery groups, all within the bigger community. And many overlap with not many hard defined edges. And we hope that if we were able to start a conversation and began to normalise conversations around loss and grief, that people would actually feel confident enough and connected and supported enough to feel that those, connect those conversations could actually go across the different groups. Grief doesn't belong to any one group. It's an emotion that belongs to everybody and affects all different people in all different parts of life. So the conversations needed to be inclusive without area boundaries and part of normal conversation, but we needed to start somewhere. So why did we think it was relevant? I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background first. I am a nurse who trained many years ago. I'm now retired. I spent my first four qualified years working in oncology, working uh, with male, female and on children's wards. I'm also a children's nurse. I loved it. I loved working with the families. I loved sharing the care. I loved working as a team. Um, I loved supporting in the good times and the bad times. And it was a real privilege to be by the side of, of people when, if they died and also supporting the families. It was a real honor. I thoroughly enjoyed that, that work. I then spent over 20 years as a health visitor, working in the community, supporting mental, physical and emotional health. And for five years, I also worked in additional to health visiting, working specifically with young people in the community, across the NHS, education and council services, helping to develop services that supported their specific health needs. I was aware of the importance of being listened to, being inclusive, being non-judgmental and encouraging individuals to recognise their own health needs and their own support networks. I was also really aware of the often slow progress in community development and the often negative impacts of being target and number driven, working with set finances and other people's priorities. Nearly four years ago, my son died unexpectedly and suddenly. He'd just started university and he was the youngest of our three children. 
The firm foundations that supported our life were just shattered. All that we'd been certain of became not so certain. And I realised that all I thought I knew about grief and loss was so minuscule to how it really was. I saw the effect of Ed's death on his sisters, his family, grandparents, work colleagues, new friends at universities, brothers and sisters of friends, school friends, friends from across rugby and cricket, our family friends. It just ricocheted out across so many communities of people, young and old people. I just saw Jade's going to put up a slide now that just shows you a little bit about the secondary losses of grief. It's a slide from the organisation Widowed and Young. And it just gives a snapshot showing that when someone dies, it's not just the physical presence um, of your loved ones that you lose. It's also the dreams and the plans of your future life with that person. It's not just your present life that's affected, it's also very much so your future life also. So the, I'll give you a minute just to look at that slide again, come back, <laughs> bring the slide back. <laughs> uh, I'll just give you a bit to sort of just look at all the secondary losses. And on top of that, I'll just say there's some recent research from the Child Bereavement Network. This is from a loss of a partner, but also from the Child Bereavement Network, it's saying that one in 29 school-age children uh, will be bereaved of a parent and sibling. By the age of 16, one in 20 young people experience the death of either one or two of the parents. And each year, 24,000 parents die each year, leaving dependent children. That data is collected from different research and it's collected from censuses, but it's not, data is collected on divorce, but it's not collected on death. It's not collected on bereavement. So these, these whole chunks here that are just missing. But if you're looking at, Again, applying to this slide, um, from my experience, the loss of confidence, absolutely. You, just in writing Christmas cards, you, you know, sort of all of a sudden, you're not writing the name on Christmas cards. Uh, you doubt what you're feeling is normal. Uh, you know, one year on, I was, you know, I, everybody had always said to me, oh, the first year is the worst. And I was thinking, oh, the first year, that was nothing. It just, you know, it's, it's just nothing. And so you start doubting your own instincts over things. The loss of the confidence, there was a definite hierarchy of grief that people thought that if you were a friend, you, you didn't grieve as much as a parent or you didn't grieve as much as a grandparent. So there was a real hierarchy in, in, in grief and your grief is your grief. Everybody is allowed to feel grief and there shouldn't be a hierarchy in it at all. The loss of the security in life. I've got two other, we've got two other girls and they learn very quickly. I mean, Olivia said, she knows tomorrow's not a given. It's, they become very, very aware of their own mortality. And that's, that's an early learning curve for them. Um, loss of security going out to different places and the fact that new conversations meeting new people and they'd say oh how many children have you got that's normal conversation but then you either feel as if you bring the conversation right the way down by telling the truth or or, or, or you just talk about the children that you've already got and then you feel guilty about excluding your children so there's all that loss of security Loss of the planned children. It's also the future weddings that you thought you'd have with them. It's the future grandchildren that you have with them. It's your future life. Um, loss of friends. You do lose some friends along the way because sometimes it's just so hard for them. It, it touches on their grief. It touches on, on, on what they're capable of. And sometimes you, you do lose friends along the way, but you, you, 
you meet some other people who become firm friends who it's easy to talk so you know it's it's that change definite loss of health you're sad it's it's sad we will always have an underlying sadness that runs through our life it doesn't mean that we don't have joy and happiness but there there is all that always that awareness now of sadness depression comes along with it it affects your physical health loneliness isolation um going back to your loss of identity you know you become you become a widower or you become a, a widow or you become an orphan there isn't a word that actually describes a parent who's lost a child there are no words to describe that there isn't there isn't one so you you know it affects everything the loss of intimacy and um, you're looking at going to nice events you're looking at going to 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 weddings and all of a sudden you're standing in different places because you have you set places to stand so it affects it affects everything it affects everything thank you jade so that's how it can just affect your present life but definitely your future life so what helped me what helped our family it was definitely the importance of talking of being included in decisions and looking at your options this was with our family and also ed's close friends everybody knew of my funeral wishes but we hadn't even thought that we needed that conversation about our children's wishes he may have had these conversations with his friends friends are so important to young people and we wanted to be able to follow his wishes and it felt important for us, for his friends, to be involved in his funeral, to decorate his coffin, to be involved in the rituals, and for everybody's grief to be acknowledged and shared. It was important to us that his community was involved. For me, I recognised I needed to offload some of my thought, thoughts and feelings to a neutral person, outside of friends and family grief. I went to counselling early on after I died and this was right for me and it was beneficial. I needed to get myself on steady ground uh, so that I could support others. Self-care and awareness is really, really important. You've got to trust your instincts and being kind to yourself is really important. It was the importance of safe places in the community. Just to walk, to look at the stars and the clouds, to look at the sunsets. It was groups such as yoga and art, places not to fix you, but just so that you could be with no time limit or expectations. You just needed space to use your imagination. It was the importance of grief being acknowledged and of being listened to. So it was sitting in cafes with, with hours with friends, dog walkings with friends, talking. Um, and it was the importance of saying Ed's name in that conversation. But then worrying that I was saying, saying his name too much for too long, that after a year I was expecting to have got over it, moved on. It was reading so many books on connecting bonds, reflecting back on my health visiting experience and the importance of attachments of all that love that's so important in the early years and thinking that love's not going to go anywhere, he's still there. And eventually become, becoming comfortable with the fact that although Ed had died, he wasn't going to go anywhere in our lives. We had so many good memories that if we didn't say his name, we'd be stuck with his death. And we'd never water those good memories or create so many new ones. We take him with us. Hundreds of percent of people die. It's one last breath. There's a whole life lived before, and there's so many lives to live. So it was the importance of those connections, building a new relationship with Ed in our family. When all of my life, my home, stability had changed. At the cemetery, it was important to take flowers to his grave, to see other people had also visited and they'd taken flowers. It was meeting others in the cemetery. It was working by the side of them, caring for others' flowers, chatting. It was new friends. It was a new community. 
It was knowing others, totally understand your loss without words. It was that peer support and still caring. Grieving is a word, it's a doing word. You've got to do it, you've got to throw yourself into it, you've got to grasp it. And visiting the cemetery initially daily gave me space to face that reality of Ed's death and begin to accommodate our loss. We still check in frequently, as do others. It's part of our routine. We say hello to him and to many others who have died, we now know in the cemetery. The cemetery community, dead and alive, definitely gets bigger. It was the importance of normalising conversations. Everything was strained at first. I'm part of a book club. We had some really, really boring books at first when people were trying not to choose anything about death, dying, sadness, but knowing that a comedy may not be appropriate, really boring books. Uh, but through books, you recognise that all you're feeling, it's been felt before and it's been expressed through arts, poems, music, books, flowers, right the way through the century, centuries. And it was sometimes recognising that conversations are so tiring and difficult, but you could use the other side of your brain, looking at art, painting, creating something to express your feelings and thoughts and to work through some sort of acceptance and understanding. And arts are so, so important. It was the importance of recognising that we all have our own grief. We're all different. There's no one face of grief. That you can't fix grief, there's no magic recipe for grief. But to have people by your side who understand and can give you choices is important. Knowing that for a long time afterwards, you almost walk on eggshells with people. Uh, you recognise that everybody's trying to put those eggshells back together, that jigsaw back together again, to give you some sort of stability. Podcasts such as Griefcast really helped us all. Listening to other stories and normalising thoughts and feelings. It's just that knowing that you're not alone. And being able to memor uh, memorialise and maintain connection. And this is where Sarah did such a fantastic job of asking if you wanted Ed's fingerprints to be taken. We hadn't even thought of this. Um, we have these imprinted on necklaces one of which I wear all the time. Um, Paul had them on, uh, on cufflinks, girls had them on bracelets. It's, it's, it, was, it was a really important thing to do and, and I'm so glad that we did. It was the choice of urn I wanted. I started off with a small urn and then realised I wanted a bigger urn because I needed to be able to hold it because I missed those hugs. You know, it, it was something concrete there. Um, and we buried his ashes in that urn instead of scattering. Um, it was somewhere that we and his friends could check in and, and chat. Others had tattoos going in together. We had a memorialised Facebook page, which was wonderful to read and look at the pictures. We knew we wouldn't have any more pictures. And so these from his life with others added more to his story. And so much of life is now digitalised, but that's a whole different area to go into. Thinking about the words to go in his headstone, that changed over time. Initially, it was all about Ed and our grief. And we had to take our time because we couldn't find the right words as a family. And that was important to us to include everybody and get it right. And unfortunately, life doesn't stagger events. Over the next two years, they were positive celebrations as well as the death of two of our parents. And sometimes you have to care for the living over the dead. And that doesn't always fit in with policies implemented of no flowers on a grave unless the memorial is in, is, is in place. Uh, so we adapted. There's an awful lot of adapting in grief. We fashioned a container for flowers to attach to his cross instead of on the ground where they weren't allowed, which allowed us time and space to think. I'll talk a bit later on if there's time and you want to ask about policies and cemeteries. 
taken our time over the wording and stone for the headstone has been so positive. It has enabled conversations about all our death, dying and funeral wishes. We know that only four are allowed to be interned and there's five of us. Who's going to be left out? We chose stone with fossils in min millions and millions of life before. Ed's words have moved up a bit so our names can go under. We don't need much space. And we know and meet many of the people in the cemetery who are going to be our long-term sleeping partners, which is actually quite comforting. It's right. So four years on, we're hoping for the stone to be put up and we're ready for it. There was no rush. He wasn't going anywhere. So many of the past rituals around dying and grief have been lost. It's that outward sign of grief where the community would rally around and be aware. Many people die in hospitals, not at home. Black clothing, armbands, drawing the curtains. There are so many more cremations now than burials. My dad's actually sitting in the lounge with my mum. We say hello when we visit, it's all good. Many ashes are kept at home and not scattered, scattered or buried. We've all got choices. Cemeteries are only one space to remember loved ones, but it is a community space for all to reflect on death, dying and remembrance, and also our heritage. Everybody's got a story, and there is comfort in loss and grief being acknowledged within the community and knowing that you're not alone. So these were just a few of the important things that helped our family and friends, the majority of which were from and in the community. It was that support, sharing and listening from friends and family. It was the time spent in safe places where I could express my thoughts and feelings. And it was normal conversation once we got over that initial strain and just dived straight in. Counselling was important straight after Ed died for me, but it did not solve my grief. It allowed me to safely express and sort my thoughts and feelings in a safe, neutral environment, which was outside and didn't impact on the grief of others. We often say I'm fine when asked how we are because sometimes it's not the right time or space or the right person to unravel your, your thoughts and feelings with. As the poster says, just because I'm smiling, it doesn't mean I'm not grieving. It is always so good to be acknowledged and asked, but we don't always feel that we can answer. Keep on asking though, or add today, put a time frame on it. How are you feeling today? Today may be a good day. Yesterday may have been absolutely rotten. Tomorrow you, you don't know. So put a time frame on it. Our emotions can change from hour to hour and it is exhausting. Personally, though, even though I was quite happy with the idea of death and dying and thought I understood grief, in reality, it was like falling into a bottomless pit. There was no set paths, path to follow. I just had to trust my instincts. Dr. Catherine Mannix in her book, With the End in Mind, talks about two days of your life, birth and death. One, birth is full of anticipation, planning, conversations, knowing your options, going to antenatal groups, baby groups, support groups. And the other we don't talk about, death and grief. It shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Everybody dies, but we don't, but we don't know our options unless someone tells us and offers them to us when our head is so full of sadness and decision-making. We may miss choices that could have helped with our grief. We can feel vulnerable, isolated, not knowing what to expect and think our thoughts and feelings are not what people expect. That what we are feeling is not normal. And so often we hold our thoughts in and we just get on with life and we don't talk about it. Someone once said to me that if you're not given opportunity to talk and express your feelings, especially with grief and loss, it's like taking that big breath in and just letting the smallest breath out, just from the top of your chest, all the time, just enough to survive. It's not taking that big breath in and out in anticipation of life, not letting, not letting go of your loved ones, but moving forward and taking your loved ones with us. 
So back to the conversations. I'm going to show, or Jade's hopefully going to put up quite a few uh, pictures to just show some of the events we've started in Geisley since our first Good Week Geisley Cafe in December 2019. And it was held to coincide with the first National Grief Awareness Week, which was spearheaded by the Good Grief Trust. Geisley Theatre offered us a room for free that we could meet over tea and cake and coffee and talk about our loved ones who had died saying their name, listening to stories amongst people who were also bereaved and understood. It was a lovely afternoon. It was full of tears, smiles and laughter. And we had by the side of the room a small tree that we could write messages on, biodegradable stars, so that we could uh, plant them afterwards. And we wrote messages on the stars um, and hung them on the tree. Uh, we left the tree at the theatre for a couple of weeks for anybody visiting the theatre to add their stars to it as well, as well with information about the cafe and posters advertising the cafe. Um, we put them on all the local notice boards, including the cemetery and Facebook, using the posters from the Awareness Week, which said, just because I'm smiling, it doesn't mean I'm not grieving. There's no one face of grief. There's no time limit on grief. And say the name, I'm thinking about them anyway. So the posters were bright and clear. The stars were later, it's working this technology. <laughs> the stars were later removed, kept safe and handled with real care with their special messages on and we planted them under daff daffodil bulbs at the top of Parkinson's Park. We'd obtained permission from the Parkinson's Park Friends Group. We looked forward to them blooming and checked on the growth in the spring and they were noticed and comments were made on them by the community. Forget-me-nots have now been planted by the side. After positive feedback from the cafe and community, we planned to hold monthly caf cafes where we could meet and talk about our loved ones. We managed January and February before we had to cancel the March cafe due to COVID-19. But we did have a lovely socially distanced meeting one-to-one -one in the bus stop outside for those that didn't get the message. We had to rethink. We had applied for two dying matters grants from the, for, the, from the, for the cafe and the cemetery. And their theme this year was dying to be heard. We had hoped to work with and within the safe spaces of uniform groups of the brownies, um, talking about plant symbolism and also organising a small Good Greek Geisley walk. We readjusted and reapplied when it became apparent that we could no longer meet face to face. We applied for a grant um, from Dying Matters and with Codswallop Theatre um, CIC who had wanted to put up a giant community collage made up of fabric squares um, to go on the, the front of the theatre. And so we also asked if anybody wanted to make fabric squares to be part of the community expression of joy, hope, grief and creativity. These squares could be made from whatever material people wanted to do. This is the collage at the front and grief is now recognised, it's still up, um, so grief is now recognised and sewed together with squares of hope, tea, Mr. T, butterflies, dragonflies, hearts, princesses, rainbows and protect the NHS. It's a full visual community expression. We also had to rethink about how we could connect and start and started using Twitter and Facebook steep learning curve for me and one that I've still got an awful lot to learn. A lot of positives and some negatives uh, when using social media. We asked if anybody wanted to join an online conversation about flowers and plants that loved ones uh, are remembered by. The wonderful comments about cuttings taken uh, from gardens, replanting from parents' gardens, flowers planted in memory of a loved one, flowers that hold special significance, trees planted in memory, um, 
It was a whole bunch of beautiful thoughts and memories as different as the flowers themselves. And these plants often pass through generations. On the cemetery notice board, we put information about the community collage and flowers that we remembered our loved, by, loved ones by. Um, with information about the Good Grief Trust and the Leave Bereavement Forum websites, and also information about podcasts. We wanted to connect despite social isolation and for the cemetery to be seen as a supportive community space full of love, open to everybody. During lockdown, we realised that many of the regular visitors would be unable to visit their loved ones' graves. And for many people, it's a regular part of their routine. We try to give weekly updates on Facebook and Twitter on the flowers that bloomed around the memorial garden in the old part of the cemetery and on the many flowers on the tracks leading to the cemetery. We looked at their symbolism. A plant app identifier was absolutely fantastic for this and I really enjoyed it. I still enjoy it on my walks. Uh, and it was amazing that so many flowers throughout time and seasons are about grief and hope and love. We were also so aware that many people would not be able to see the updates that didn't use Twitter, that didn't use Facebook, but we hope that it may generate conversations and connection. And we tried to link in with poems, Shakespeare, Pansies for Thoughts, Rosemary for Roman Remembrance, we hope to plant up some of the new flowers with significance in, the two, in two new planters, which have been delayed, seeing as though everybody's on furlough, we've not got them yet. But flowers carry meaning without words. On the Cemetery Friends, first socially distanced tidy up a couple of weeks ago, we took the display of all the flowers and their meaning up to the cemetery for any passerby to look at if they wished. You've got the hand gel on the top for anybody to use. The board, very kindly borrowed from Codswallop, will also be at our next tidy up and hopefully in the corner of the room in the cafe, which we hope to hold in the bigger room at the theatre if restrictions allow. We also put up some beautiful donated bird boxes and a bee box in the cemetery working with the Countryside Ranger. So to our plans and our last picture, uh, which are benches, which are also another way that a lot of people memorialise, uh, got some wonderful uh, messages on them. We've got a provisional socially distanced walk on the Shevin, arranged for the 18th of September, working within the restrictions. Uh, Places are limited, we're just hoping to get two, two bubbles going at the moment and we ask that anybody who's interested to contact us on the Good Grief Geisley um, email which, which we'll put up. It's just a small start but it's trying to reconnect safely. We, we're so aware that so many people have felt isolated over these last few months. Again, we hope to start the cafes again in October in a bigger room if we can. And we hope to organise something for the second National Grief Awareness Week in December, uh, which I think is going to be so, so important. Um, yeah, so that people feel supported. We have a small donated, small number of donated bird boxes from Leeds City Council available, which can be made to remember a loved one who have died. And younger people may need a bit of supervision to make these, depending on the age, but could be a lovely way to remember, connect with nature, and also to encourage that togetherness and conversation through the generations. We're looking to get more benches in the cemetery. At the moment, there are none in the new part where the majority of the new burials are. We've just been given funding for one. I think we need more spaces for people to sit, especially in the area where the loved ones are buried and just have a chance to connect with others, especially with all the indoor restrictions. We had just started before lockdown trying to connect and work with the local football club, Mead and Town Hall, the uniform organisations. It was all really positive. 
and it would be fantastic if anybody in the community would like to connect and get in contact to see how that we, how we can support one another um, and also support the obvious compassion that's already in our area especially with ideas how we can normalize conversations around grief we've got a good number of good grief cards which are here and um, which have got um which which we've managed to get from the dying matters grounds uh, which are signpost to over 700 um bereavement services and um, so we're hoping to give those out to the local hairdressers and to parlours um, and, and just try and, and barbers just to try and give people a, a, a means of supporting others. Um, and we'll also continue on Twitter and Facebook and hopefully I'll get better. And as we become aware of national and local events that may encourage conversations, we'll, put, we'll post those. We've got the Good Grief Bristol Festival in October, which has got about over 100 speakers. It was supposed to be in May, but it was delayed. Um, and this is a free festival at the moment that people can, uh, can just sign up for and, and they're taking up the sign, sign up things at the moment. That should be absolutely fantastic. Kirklees and Redbridge Libraries, working with Northumbria University, are death positive libraries and they've got regular online book events talking with authors who have written about death and dying and loss. Really, really good. Um, and I just noticed yesterday that Leeds Library are holding two online talks of the history of Leeds cemeteries. Um, it's all just getting that conversation and normalising that conversation. There'll also be the opportunity to raise awareness of some of the surveys, surveys and research that are being offered, asking about our experience of death and grief. I totally acknowledge how hard this may be for people to want to get involved, yet it feels that it has to work both ways. And hopefully if we can find the confidence to talk and we can do that better if we feel supported in the community, and services really want to listen to us and provide opportunities for our views to be heard so that we're working together. Things will improve, things will improve, but we have got to have our voice heard, you know, and we've got to be given opportunities to do that. And a big part of that will be the research and views from a wider community. And that will hopefully influence policies and care that supports grief, not just for and in services, but also for our community also. And I'll continue for as long as they'll have me, joining you with the monthly uh, Full Circle um, Funerals Bereavement Group on Zoom, which has been an eye-opener. It's uh, helped me personally has been a fantastic way of normalising conversations and getting used to Zoom. Um, and it's just stepping out of your comfort zone to actually do it. So that was just a brief overview. Thank you for listening. Have you got any questions? <laughs>